Right, in this video, I'm going to talk about uh, calibrating your shift firmness in a high performance 4L60E and also cover some valve body modifications that you could do as well. So, starting with the spacer plate, um, whether you're running a shift kit or not, uh, the primary means of calibrating shifts, um, you know, setting shift firmness and or quality and feel is done through the spacer plate. And everything that you're doing with the transmission along with vehicle application, engine power, converter stall speed, rear gears, all that has to be taken into consideration when you're making decisions uh, around orifice sizes. So in this application, um, we're going to be installing a 4L60E into a uh, 1930s Ford Coupe that's going to have a roughly 600 to 650 horsepower LS1 somewhere in there and it's going to be used in a street strip application. So mostly cruising, uh, mostly driving on the street, but it will see the track occasionally. So uh, with all that in mind, I'll walk through um, the feed hole sizes in this plate along with my rationalization for um, why I selected the sizes that I did. All right, hopefully you can see this, it's not too much glare. All right, so we have the one, two, the three, four, the two, three, and the two, three exhaust. Those are gonna be the four holes that you're gonna to wanna to drill, regardless of whether you're installing a shift kit or not. Now, if you're installing a shift kit and um, you're not intimately familiar with all the different hydraulic modifications and you know all the ins and outs, just follow the instructions in the shift kit to a T. But with that said, we're not installing a shift kit here per se, um, although I'll show you some options that are available in shift kits. Um, what we're doing is kind of a custom calibration. So um, I'm gonna be drilling the one, two feed hole at 80 thousands. Now, you should know that if you haven't watched some of the other uh, videos in, you know, that feature this transmission, that I'm installing a Sonics super hold servo assembly, uh, both in the one, two and the three, four. So, all other things equal, the larger uh, apply area that you have in your servo, the firmer that your shift is going to be, regardless of your hole sizes, regardless of any other mods you do to the transmission. Like if you do nothing else, all you do is install a uh, aftermarket servo kit or even the Corvette servo in place of the 553 servo, then your shifts will be a little bit firmer. So with that in mind, um, we're going to keep the feed hole size for the one two at 80 thousandths. If this was a Corvette servo that we were um, going to be installing, then I would probably um, drill this to 93 thousandths. The two three feed, I'm going to drill to 110 thousandths. The two three exhaust, I'm going to leave at 93 thousandths. Again, if you were uh, using a Corvette servo, I'd probably open that up to 100 thousandths. And again, for the same reasons, the more ply and or release area you have, uh, the quicker the release is going to be. So uh, we don't want this, um, we don't want the band coming off before the 2.3 has had a chance to fully apply. All right, there's a timing there that has to occur between those two applied elements, apply and release, so that you don't have either tie-ups or flares. In the 3.4, you have pretty much um, you know, almost an infinite amount of latitude in terms of uh, what you want to do to firm up that shift. Uh, hole size here we're going to use is 110 thousandths. I have two other um, two other little orifices here in the plate that uh, I have marked. Uh, this one here is the TCC signal feed port or orifice, and this is the actuator feed limit valve orifice. You really don't want to change the sizing here. Um, for example, the actuator feed limit valve, its job is to provide AFL pressure to all the solenoids. Okay, So as it's doing what it's supposed to be doing, you want to make sure that that fluid flow or that oil flow to those solenoids remains uninterrupted and is as, I guess, high a pressure that you can achieve without being too high. And I know that sounds real vague, but if you drill this hole, then that will actually lower AFL pressure. So if you have a worn valve body and you don't have the means to test your valve body, like we tested this valve body in the, um, uh, 
the AFL valve was holding 23 inches of lift, so that's an extremely healthy valve body. But let's just say yours is, I don't know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 13, 14, 15. Um, still usable for factory application, but if you drill this hole, you're going to reduce the AFL fluid pressure in a valve that's already a little worn, or a valve circuit, I should say, that's already a little worn. So keep this factory, all other things equal. Now, I know in Transgo kits, um, at least some of them, I think the basic kit, the SK4L60E, has you drill this hole out along with this hole to 93 thousandths. I believe the reason they have you do that is because the spring that they give you to install inside the primary AFL spring is of sufficient tension that if you didn't do this, then you might actually have too much AFL pressure in um, a valve body that's you know even moderately healthy. So in other words, you know, if we want to break it down numerically and, and establish a cutoff healthy versus unhealthy, I'd say 15 inches of lift or more is considered healthy. Um, you still may have too much AFL pressure if you don't drill this hole. Um, but unless you're running a shift kit or unless you really know your hydraulics, um, I would either A, follow the instructions in the shift kit to a T, or B, leave this um, orifice alone. And same with the TCC, it's a, a, generally speaking the same principle, all right? You really don't need to change these two um, feed ports at all in the spacer plate. Okay, I gotta repair that plate. There's a couple um, check bowl locations that I know are worn, so um, uh, Fitzall makes a uh, plate repair kit. I have a separate video on that. Um, this one came in with the one, two already um, you know, with a sleeve already installed, so I gotta do a couple more of them, and then the plate will be good. We're gonna be using Torlon check balls in this uh, in this valve body, so uh, you know we're not using the steel check balls, so that plate should last forever once I'm done with it. All right, I'll talk about accumulators. So as I mentioned, when it comes to fourth gear, you have an almost unlimited amount of latitude as far as what you can do to firm up that shift. Uh, one of the more popular things that builders do, and I often do it myself uh, frequently, even in uh, mild applications or stock builds in some cases, is I will use two fourth accumulator servo pistons in the bore, and I will omit any springs. So I'll delete the spring. I won't install any kind of springs. Uh, how this works is you want to take your old uh, fourth accumulator piston that you know came in with the transmission, um, and you can grind off these little bosses here, but what you really need to do is you need to grind about maybe a third of the length off of the three legs. All right, you're gonna install that into the bore upside down with no seal. Okay, then you can install your, your pin over top of it, or you install your pin first, I mean, whatever you wanna do, but keep this in the bore, no seal, and then install your new fourth accumulator piston over top of it, interlocking the legs. Okay, just like that. And that will defeat the accumulator to the tune of around 90 to 95%. Um, and allow all of that apply oil to flow to the fourth gear apply servo in your servo assembly giving your fourth gear um, a nice firm upshift. Uh, it's not going to be harsh, but it's going to be crisp and you'll feel it um, versus the almost imperceptible 3-4 upshift that comes um, you know, from a factory calibrated transmission. So um, this is a great upgrade to do for stock or mild builds. For anything greater than that, like I would say anything more than about 4,000 RPM, then I would just recommend blocking that whole accumulator circuit off. You can use a check ball um, and simply, you know, pound it into the uh, feed orifice in the case, or feed port I should say, in the case with a drift punch, and then just leave the piston, the spring, and you know, the pin out of it. Um, and you can delete that fourth accumulator check ball as well. All right. Second gear. So we're going to be running um, a Sonex pinless accumulator piston here with the spring kit. Um, going to be running that in the fourth gear as well as the forward um, accumulator. But for your one two, there's not a whole lot you need to do with this. 
Uh, you can shim the one two. In other words, Transgo's HD2 kit, they come with these discs. You can install none, one, two, or three. And that will firm up the one two shift as you need it to. But based on what you're doing, you know, in the accumulator, that's going to drive um, what you do with the spacer plate feed port for the one two shift. So in this case, we're running the Sonics kit. And we're also running that um, Sonic Super Hold Servo. So um, again, it's a, this is another example where all of the parts you're using are going to play into the decision you make around that orifice size. If you were running a factory setup, in other words, um, you know, just factory springs, factory, and you just wanted to firm up your one-two shift for the 553 servo that's already in there, you can drill the plate out a little bit, um, but you don't want to get too aggressive and you need to drill your 3-4 out, excuse me, your 2-3 out, as well as your 2-3 exhaust. All right, so everything that um, you're doing, there has to be balance to it. All right, this um, housing is what you might see in an early 4L60E. Uh, these were installed in all 700R4s. Um, I would strongly recommend that you replace your 1-2 accumulator pistons on every rebuild as well, especially if it's a 4L60E and it you know, is coming in with a plastic piston. Um, you want aluminum pistons in the forward accumulator and in the 1-2. One, um, one thing I'll mention with the 1-2 is that I've seen this, you know, enough where I can comfortably say that uh, springs that come in Transgo shift kits, they have a tendency to break. Okay, so just keep that in mind. And when they do, you will have a very late, harsh 1-2 upshift and you will not have um, code P1870 set. So if you have a late harsh upshift, and the factory springs can break too. Um, I mean, all these springs can break. But I've seen it a lot with the Transgo springs, so that's why I mention it. Uh, if you have a late harsh 1-2 upshift and you do not have trouble code P1870, and maybe you've already um, made a corrective, uh, you know, repair, installed an updated valve in your uh, TCC regulator valve in the valve body, then um, I would check the 1-2 accumulator and see if the primary spring, the outer spring, is broken in there. And to get this piston out, you would just insert um, your air nozzle here and just, you know, force air into it and the piston will pop right out. All right, now I'll move on to the valve body. And there's nothing really to say here with these bolts, they're just bolts. So there's a few different things that you'll want to do with the valve body, especially in a high performance application, uh, a few areas you need to address. Uh, first one's the actuator feed limit valve. You want to make sure that this valve and bore, uh, the AFL circuit in the valve body is healthy. And this is going to be the location for the AFL. You're going to test it right here. Okay, I have a separate video on this, so you can check that out. And I'll walk you through the testing procedure if you have the Sonics uh, VAC test machine kit. And um, if you build a lot of transmissions, I mean, that's almost a, a necessity. I would say it's a must-have. It's not an option. You need to know if valve bodies that are coming in are, are not healthy so that you can advise customer to replace them. And if you're a shop, you already know that. But this is really more for either um, someone that's just getting into the business or, um, you know, trying to figure out how to set up their transmission shop or operation. Um, the Sonics VAC test machine is a must-have. All right, with that said, um, the AFL valve, you can run a dual spring setup that will increase AFL pressure and will compensate for a, a slightly worn AFL uh, bore. Um, if your bore is testing at 10 inches or less, then you're going to need to install um, a Sonex oversized actuator feed limit valve kit. And you'll need the reamer along with the uh, fixture and the jig, the holding um, setup to bolt this valve body in place and then ream out the bore so that you can permanently repair um, the AFL valve circuit there in the valve body. Uh, once you do that, it's permanent. There's a sleeve, you know, the valve comes in a sleeve so that when the sleeve wears out, you just, you know, replace the whole kit and caboodle. It's, uh, I think, 30 or $40 from Sonics for just, you know, the, the updated valve. All right, uh, torque converter clutch regulator valve from 1995 to 2000. These were really problematic. Um, trouble code P1870 would set, 
and uh, you would have late harsh one two upshifts. Variety of ways you can approach this, but um, the basically what you're ultimately trying to do is prevent the valves in here from moving or stroking. Okay, so you have a factory lineup. If you get a hold of some check balls, these are 185 thousandths in diameter. You can put two of them in there and that will stop these valve trains from stroking. So you have your factory spring, your inboard and outboard valves, and you know that's it. That fixes it in terms of uh, converting the pulse width modulation to an on-off apply. Now, if the bore is heavily worn, this will not fix it because you're still gonna have a little bit of leakage there past the factory valving. So then you would wanna step into either a fits all valve, which is what I'm ultimately gonna install into this valve body. This fixes it permanently, and this will work with the factory um, inboard valve to block that valve from moving and seal off the bore, um, preventing any leaks in that circuit. Uh, it's a permanent fix. It, you know, it's done at that point. Um, if you're using a Transgo shift kit, you can install uh, the, the valve and the spring that they include and follow their instructions. Uh, this usually addresses most TCC issues, uh, you know, unless it's really severely worn, then you want to step to a fits all valve. Or if you have the tooling, then you can install the Sonics um, TCC regulator valve kit. These are also oversized and they require the same tooling that the AFL requires to install. So you got to ream the bore and then you install the oversized sleeve and valve kit and you know again it's it's basically done. All right, another area that you want to address is going to be the 32 downshift valves, 32 control valve. So the 32 downshift valve is located right next to the uh, um, 32 control solenoid and 32 control valve and if you're running a transgo kit they will give you a purple spring that's you know really tightly coiled and what that does is that will block this valve from stroking so here's the factory spring as you can see it's you know very little tension when you take uh, when you take the bore plug um, retainer clip out you want to make sure you have a like a thumb on the bore plug because it'll fly across the room but otherwise this spring allows this valve to stroke. And so the reason why you're blocking this off is so that you can manage fluid flow, fluid conduit routing between the uh, two three and the three two circuit. These valves basically are analogous to a pulse width modulated or gradual three two downshift release of fluid. Um, so think of it along the same or similar kind of lines as how the pulse width modulation works for the torque converter clutch apply strategy. Basically the amount of time that passes between when the computer commands a downshift to when the downshift mechanically finishes um, executing is going to be shortened up considerably when you block off these two valves and prevent them from moving. You want to block them inboard. All right, so inboard. This I'm just using a, um, a boost valve spring from you know the pump, just an extra one. Uh, you can use a, you know a, I guess a a plug of sorts. Um, you might have to have it made. Um, same with this. One thing that I will say with the uh, solenoid is you want to make sure that whatever plug you're using um, does not come in contact with the um, you know the orifice itself uh, the screen etc you want it to contact the outer perimeter you know the hard plastic of the solenoid and you want it to just block it off it shouldn't be an interference fit but there shouldn't be any um, you know any gap between whatever you're putting there and I actually have to have a sleeve made for this um, so between these two downshift valves being blocked you've taken what is a kind of multi-channel routing for 3-2 fluid and um, centrally routed it through one orifice location and that will allow you to better manage that shift that downshift that and high rate return springs in the drum and um, you know of course orifice sizing in the plate
Okay, um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I need to cover in the valve body. The one-two accumulator, I don't have that here on the, uh, you know, on the on the towel. I actually fully assembled this valve body and took it partially apart to make this video. But uh, one-two accumulator, you can also um, change the uh, quality of that shift by installing different springs in place of the factory spring. Um, you know. It's up to you. Like I said, if you're running a shift kit, just follow the instructions in the kit. Um, one other thing I'll say about the 3-2 um, the downshift, when you're swapping the spring out, don't get rid of it. What you can do, I mean, I already have one here, but what you can do if I didn't, is I can install this spring inside the primary spring for the AFL valve, and that will allow me to increase AFL pressure to the solenoids and you know, like I said, if that bore is a little bit worn, then this will correct it and it'll be fine. It'll function as it needs to. So this spring came with the valve body, um, you know, came in with the transmission. Um, but if you didn't have it or if it wasn't there, I would just simply take this spring and stick it inside the primary spring. Electronic pressure control solenoid, I would not m modify or adjust this in any way. Um, it's got a little screw back here that you can adjust the line pressure, but again, I, I've never ever messed with it and it's not recommended. Uh, anything you need to do with line pressure changes or calibration, you can do you know, in the transmission. Uh, you can do a tune. That's also, you know, uh, I guess that's also fine. But if you, you pinned me down and you said, you know, if you only had to choose, you know, uh, when it comes to calibrating um, line pressure and uh, shifts and all that either through you know mechanically using com parts and components inside the transmission or the PCM I would choose to calibrate it mechanically I would leave the PCM tune alone as it relates to the transmission upshifting downshifting control and line pressure one thing I would consider doing in certain applications when it comes to tuning is um, tuning the torque converter clutch uh, when it comes on, uh, when it locks up. Uh, these transmissions are designed to lock up, I believe, in third and fourth. I would tune that out in certain applications, not all, but in certain applications. Um, so it's it's going to depend on what your situation is and how you're using your vehicle. If you know if that makes sense for you to do, there's there's a few key things you can do tuning with these 4L60Es that will also um, improve performance, improve longevity, and drive down the risk of failure. And that's one of them. Um, I'll make a separate video on tuning at some point. Uh, you know where I actually show you. Um, and walk you through step by step on how to do that. But first, I gotta figure it out myself because I'm not involved at all in any aspect of uh, tuning. Uh, I don't do HP tuners. Um, I don't um, use any other kind of tuning software. Uh, I just simply build the transmission and you know, I leave the tuning to somebody that knows what they're doing. All right, um, I think that covers everything I wanted to cover. Um, all new electrical components, you know, new solenoids, new pressure switch manifold assembly, just use OEM whenever possible. Um, and valve body uh, accumulators, you know, they all get 104 to 110 inch pounds of torque. Um, yeah, I think we're good. So if you have any questions, comments, go ahead and leave them below. Uh, as always, thank you so much for watching. And, um, you know, hopefully this has helped you with your 4L60E or at least um, give you a better understanding of how to mechanically calibrate shift quality in one of these transmissions.